Welcome. This is the Global Summit House Podcast. Catch power interviews and discussions with influential, inspiring, and powerful people. Explore what's possible by tuning into this podcast with our all-new The Writer's Project episodes, featuring one of the world's most inspired thinkers and writers. Visit our website at www.globalsummithouse.com. I'm really pleased to introduce Bella Caroli, author of Medley, Songs of Life, A Couple Out of Tune. Welcome, Bella. Thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us. You're welcome. Tell everybody a little bit about your background as an author and how you got going. Uh, Probably started at the age of three. It sounds funny, but uh, by at three, I could pick out all the letters uh, on my mother's typewriter, <laughs> all the all the alphabetical letters on my mom's typewriter. And at the age of five, I was reading books that were generally, uh, you know, adult level. Right. And I started writing. I think in third grade, I started. I don't know poetry, probably or stories. I'm not sure which, but I found an old report card. Uh, from third grade that that met, the teacher mentioned that I was doing some writing and I thought, oh I thought it was fifth grade but obviously not <laughs> so um I just started from there and then I started to composing music and writing lyrics I started out by actually writing some music to a um a poem I found in one of my mother's magazines huh. and uh then after a while, I just started writing my own songs and just kept it up. Where there were, there were breaks, long breaks sometimes, in between both writing and music. But music was always pretty steady. And, and I just have this flair for writing. I, I don't know. It just, it's just there. I, I was going to ask you about that. It sounds like, like writing is, is a pretty core piece of who you are. It is. I write about anything. Um, I'm a fictional writer, so I don't write about factual things per se. But because uh, I have to have facts in my stories, Mm -hmm. I need to look up information. And sometimes all I need is one small piece of information. And I'll just, uh, you know, incorporate that because it's all that's necessary for the story. Right. However, I, I, I am doing a series of stories about animals at a place called The Rescue Place. And I double-checked to make sure that there wasn't a company in America called The Rescue Place. <laughs> at the time I did my checking, there wasn't. There was in Great Britain, but it was only for German shepherds. And this <laughs> takes in all animals. So I have a series of 10 stories planned for that, some of which are already written. And um, I just write whatever, whatever strikes my fancy. So the book is, I titled it Medley because a medley is a grouping of all different kinds of songs. Right. And this is all different kinds of stories. So as you're growing up and finding that between music and writing are are pretty big outlets for you, uh, is it just that? it's easy to just kind of, is it almost about observing what's going on around you and deciding to write about things that strike your fancy? Um, sometimes yes. Sometimes no. Sometimes I just get an idea. A word can set me off and I'll write a complete story around one word. <laughs> Very cool. Um, okay. So let's talk a little bit about uh, how you got going with the stories that are in Medley. How did that start? How did it take shape? Um, it started, well, probably sometime during the 1980s, late 1980s, actually, because one of the stories, well, not that, that one isn't. I, did, I do have one that I wish I had included, but uh, it's not there. Um, you know, the story of uh, Morgue. I was living in Southern California at the time, and 
at that time there were a lot of television programs about the paranormal or stories where I don't know people saw ghosts or they had you know extra ordinary ex, uh, experiences. Right. And I don't know why I picked morgue, but for some reason it, it, something must have set me off on that one <laughs> because uh, or I just got this idea and I uh, um, so I wrote the story morgue and my friend had worked for the studios. And he thought it would be good uh, on television. So I said, well, good. Contact one of your friends there and let's get this started. But he <laughs> never did. So it just sat there. But I could see how that easily could, how that one could be turned into um, either a movie or a, uh, a television series. Uh, it's about this, this guy who, is the, uh, who works in a hosp big hospital. And they have a morgue, and it's open 24-7. And so he does the graveyard shift. And he encounters a number of spirits, both from the dead and other places, huh. during uh, a section of the time that he is working there. Right. And <laughs> he, gets, he gets a very big surprise near the end. Excellent. And is it, is I, like, I, like surprise, surprise? I like surprise endings. A lot of my stories have surprise endings. Yeah, yeah. Is it a scary surprise or is it a good, happy it's surprise? It's a good surprise. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, talk about when you're writing something like that. Is it just, do the characters just live in you? I mean, yes. Yes, it, they do. I let the story write. I let the story write itself. Isn't that I fascinating? I get this idea and I get, an, uh, um, I'm, I'm, uh, and I just start working with it whatever the names come to me the site the scenes come to me mm -hmm. i just start writing and, and whatever whatever comes out comes out i have heard more people say that specific thing that it's almost like the words are flowing through you is that a they are because if you ask me anything about any of the stories or even poetry that i've read uh, or written excuse me um I can't tell you what's in there. I have to reread it myself. Isn't that to tell you what's in there? Um, I can tell you about the story, as some stories in detail because they've stuck, but I can't do that with every one. So it's almost like a, an observing process, or, or you being the translator of whatever the thought is into into words, but then you need to go back and look at it to really see what you've written especially with my music yes interesting I, I, yeah i mean i've written a lot of good lyrics i've got i've got a cd out um and but if you ask me what the words to my songs are i can't tell you oh, that is because it didn't come from me and do you like that or does it kind of freak you out it does not freak me out at all it's just i've incorporated that over the years and it's just so much a part of me that if i didn't have it right i wouldn't know what to do Oh, that is so fascinating. I, it's just so many places that that kind of experience applies, whether it's, you know, the person driving down the freeway and realizes they, they haven't been consciously driving for the last 15 minutes or, you know, to artists, uh, this whole idea of kind of flowing it. I just think it's such a, a fascinating thing. Um, so when you are you start with an idea and then that just kind of fuels this inner. Yeah. Like in fact, the, what you just mentioned fueled one of the stories I was driving between Nevada and Arizona and I saw a package on the side of the road and I got curious. I thought, well, what's somebody's going to be missing that package when they get to their destination, they won't know where it is. Right. And that kind of concerned me too, but I had no idea. And of course, when you're driving 70 miles an hour down the freeway, <laughs> you're not going to stop. Yeah. So, but that that somehow pop gave me the idea for the story of the drop, hmm. and I created this whole scenario about this curious woman who gets herself into all kinds of misadventures because she thinks that um, she's observing the the package packages in her daily mail run between two two towns, hmm. and sometimes the packages are. Uh, are colored and sometimes they're just plain brown paper 
And she, she's saying, what the heck is all this going on? And then she tries telling herself, it's none of my business. <laughs> but uh, she, can't, she can't not make it her business. So she does that and gets herself into a crazy series of adventures, which actually turns out to be a big surprise and a, and a better job for her at the end. Mm -hmm. So talk about a couple of your other favorite stories and, and just a, a little overview of them without giving any of the good stuff away. <laughs> well, um, King Lun's Challenge. Yes. came about because a friend of mine when i lived in arizona my best one my one of my best friends down there well she has a maine coon cat and this cat is something else and uh we were talking some one time about i don't know rhyme words rhyming and i love to play with words one of my stories uh, the silver plate is a is has word play and i'm not going to give it tell you anything more about that but yeah. uh Oh dear, I lost my train of thought here. That's okay. You were talking about how one of your friends, good friends, had a main. Cool oh yeah, cat. that cat, right? So anyway, somehow or other, we got onto the subject of the moon, and we were looking for. I think it was we were looking for rhyming words. So we come up with moon, croon, uh, stuff like that, and we come up with the image of the cat singing, sitting on a swing. Um, singing to the moon because she she loves the moon, right? So Great. that uh, that was as far as it went. And then she she was talking about she had seen a character somewhere. Uh, somehow or other, I guess uh, Lun was the name. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyhow, uh, I just got the idea. I don't even know how it came about, but I got the idea to to, to take King Lun. I think that's what it was. We wrote, I wrote a poem about King Lun, the, you know, sitting on a swing, talking, singing to the moon. And that was a, a writing, uh, just a writing exercise that we did for ourselves. Right. And then I took it and I decided to take it farther. So I decided, well, there's a nursery rhyme where a cow jumps over the moon. So why not have the cat jump over the moon? I love this. <laughs> and uh, it's a totally tongue-in-cheek story, but it's very, very real as well, especially the last part where the king has to, before he can jump over the moon, he has to go through some um, you know, personal challenges. And it's those personal challenges that I, I personally find very gripping because when I reread the story, that's what I get caught up in the last challenge that he has to, to face before he can jump over the moon. Got it. And when you look at these stories, do you find that there are common themes that run through them? Is there something that kind of ties them all together? Yes and no. The stories are so varied that there isn't one particular theme I don't think that is in the stories. However, one of the things that I do write about is God. And I'm working on a novel right now that has a lot of spiritual information in it. And so God is probably my theme that runs, that flows. He may not be mentioned, but right. I might take a, a phrase or something and it'll be there. Somewhere, somewhere in that story, uh, Morg is a good example of that. Um, uh, the uh, um, Morg, what the Morg clerk does, is a good example of that. And when you say that God runs through these, tell everybody a little bit about what that looks like from your perspective, because you know God can mean a, a whole lot of things to a whole lot of people, can it? It does because everybody is different and their perception of who God is is different. Um, I have a very, um, I think possibly, I want to say open-minded view. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of spiritual knowledge thanks to a friend of mine who I knew who she was long before she found out she was a prophet. And I knew it years before that. And I learned a ton of stuff from her. And 
some of that comes out in my stories in one way or another. As I say, it might be a passing sentence. God might just simply be mentioned. He might not even be mentioned at all. But some of the things that, that go on might, might indicate that he's there. Mm-hmm. I don't necessarily mention him, but I might put in some pieces of spiritual advice that uh you know that i learned from her and put that in there and that's what my what my novel is really about i think my novel is really about what god can do don't you uh, think that through whomever he chooses don't you think that at some level that part of your process for writing is an expression of that uh, the that the way your writing happens is an expression yeah. of that Yes, most definitely, because I start uh, in the novel, one of the characters is explaining um, the spiritual experience, a spiritual experience to a friend of hers. Mm -hmm. And she gets into some deep stuff and it just comes out. I have no, whatever I write, sometimes I have control over it and sometimes I just get into myself and let it flow. And usually when that happens, somewhere along the line, there's, the, there's some spiritual information in that story. Mm-hmm. Don't you think that part of what makes your stories compelling is that kind of deeper connection? And, even, and it doesn't even need to, to be like you've said. It doesn't need to be even written in words. But there's something, a depth to what you're writing that comes out as, yes. as a spiritual story- depth. The, the story that comes to mind with regard to that, I do, my characters, let me put it this way. My characters can be anybody from a high-ranking government official, as in um, mistaken identity, mm-hmm. to the eye of the beholder, and the main characters in that story are an elf and a mouse. <laughs> and all of my stories uh, uh, teach uh, teach people something, right? Uh, maybe not directly, but there's there's information in the stories about that the characters say, that the events portray, that something something about life, life in in general, and anybody can relate. My stories are are for people from age four to one hundred and four, or two hundred and four, if you want to live yeah. that long. Yep. Uh, So when you think about this, uh, in terms of the lessons that are there and the things for people to learn, don't you find, I want to be clear for our audience that this isn't you saying, well, this is the lesson you need to learn. I almost feel like you write these and you find out what the lesson is after you've written. That's correct. That's correct. I do not start with a preconceived notion of right. I'm going to write this story about, well, all right. So my novel is about a lizard, believe it or not. <laughs> and uh, all I decided to do was to write, a, write a story about a lizard. Right. I never anticipated that it would be, I'd be halfway, halfway through the story in 240 pages. Wow. It just developed. And what and I'm starting to write now, now I'm starting on the second half, but, um, it or must be an it. amazing process. I mean, you, it must be, uh, I, I, I want to say, it's not the word that I want to use, but it, it's almost like it's life-giving. Like there's just, uh, this, what is it, the, the phrase, the wellspring of life? It's like you're tapped into that. Po- quite possibly I am. I don't, I don't think about it. Um, as I say, like, for example, I wrote a mystery. I write mysteries every once in a while when, when I can figure out what the ending is. Um, but I wrote a mystery story. I t- mentioned earlier that a word can set me off. Mm-hmm. Um, the word in this case actually is two, and it's called perfect pitch, which I do not have. <laughs> Nor I. <laughs> I have relative pitch, which means that if I hear a tone, I can tell you, if I hear two tones, I can tell you about how far apart they are, or one is higher, one is lower, and give you try to give you the interval between. Right. Um, so if somebody plays a note and says, this is B flat, and I hear it, and then, some, then they play another note, I can kind of figure out from 
where B flat, the, mem the memory of, oh, that's B flat, and this one is there, that must be F. Got it. I mean, I can do it that way. But people who have perfect pitch just have, they just know, they don't maybe know the names of the notes. Right. Um, but they have the ability, if they were a musician, and many musicians do have perfect pitch, um, they can tell you right on uh, what the note is. They'll tell you right off what the note is. Right. And, or, or tell you if it's sharp or flat. Now, I can't do that. Uh, I've been a musician most of my life. I can't do that. Right. But I could write a story about it, and I did. How Perfect Pitch Saved a College Student from a Criminal Record. <laughs> I love it. Is that in this book? Unfortunately, it's not. I don't know what I, uh, I moved several times, and some of my stories are packed away, and uh, some of them might have gotten lost. A friend of mine took some a bunch of boxes when I was moving from from Arizona to um, to Las Vegas, and she took a couple of um, trailer loads of boxes to store in her barn to help me out. In the meantime, we I. I lost contact with her over the last couple of years. And when I mm -hmm. called the number, it was disconnected. Uh, so I have no idea what happened to her. Oh. And she did, she did tell me a couple of years ago that the barn had gotten uh, disarrayed. So my stories, a couple of my stories might, might have been in, in one of those boxes. I'm sure there were, in fact, I'm sure they, they were. Mm. Um, so I have to rewrite that one. I don't have that one. I have to rewrite it. And it's never the same when you rewrite something. I bet. Because I the bet. original the original flow isn't there right right that you tapped into initially right so we're getting close to the end and i want to just ask you when you think about the set of stories in your book medley um what do you think when somebody's read the entire book what do you think some of the things that they're going to take away are well, hopefully, they'll hopefully they'll like the stories and want want to buy my next book. Um, but what I I think I'm going to shake people up, hmm. uh, pot, especially with Morg, and um, probably with some of the other stories. Mm -hmm. Some of them, as I say, are uh, King Lun is just tongue in cheek. Hopefully they'll get they'll learn that you know something about life that they didn't know before, even if it's just something like the mouse and the uh, and the elf king, right? Uh, the mouse king and the elf king in in uh, the one story, the eye of the beholder that what they see isn't necessarily what it is. Yeah, <laughs> that holds true for so much of life, doesn't it? It does, and I think that's part of all of the stories, really, too. Because um, uh, King Lun definitely experiences that in in his tra in his uh, training, and I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Um, well, in Morg, what you see isn't necessarily what you get. Got it. Or what you get isn't what you see, or whatever, whichever <laughs> way you want to put that. Right. And there's humor in the stories too. The drop is funny, King, as I, and and they're not all they're not sad. They just are. Got and it. the story it came it came from beneath the bed. Yep. Is is someone who has to revisit a childhood experience of the monster under the bed theme. And what result? At what then? The result of that. I love how uh, diverse the stories are, Bella. I, I just think it's uh, it's so fascinating, and yet at the same time, you make it really clear that uh, there are some common themes there, and and, and not not uh, not lessons that you're pointing your finger at people, but lessons that come through this flow experience of writing, and I, I just think it's such a neat concept to to put a, such a, a wide variety of stories together in a way that there's still that common thread throughout them. 
Um, yeah, I think there is a thread. Uh, don't I, as I say, I, I didn't know when I was asked to put some stories together. Mm -hmm. Um, I just, I, I just grabbed some and, uh, thought things that I thought would be interesting for people to read and they're going to be thought provoking. Some of them are just fun. Some of them are thought provoking. There's a one page story in there that is a surprise ending. And it's uh, and uh, God is very definitely present in that one. Love it. But again, it's thought provoking. And, and uh, I think I don't set out to do this. I write what I want to write. And if I have a talking car, um, or a mouse, right, or someone who goes through um, a really miserable time, uh, a human being who goes through a really miserable time. But they all come out at the end. They all come out having learned something, or having done something. Um, <laughs> now, if we could just get all humans to go through experiences and come out learning something, right? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it takes a while before people learn, I've, and I've had that experience personally. Yes, it and does. some of the some of the characters that I write about, uh, the one in the, my novel, uh, there's a couple characters in there that I'm I'm writing about. Uh, wishing I were them, you know. Um, but their characters are very believable. They're not, no matter what it is. If you can accept that a car can talk, you can accept the story. I can accept that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Bella Coroli, you are the author of Medley, Songs of Life, A Couple Out of Tune. Uh, it can be found at globalsummithouse.com and amazon.com, we think in July of 2020, uh, assuming we get through this COVID virus thing. Um, and some of the stories include The Silver Plate, The Drop, It Came From Beneath the, the Bed, King Loans Challenge, and Night Train to Chicago. Bella, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Any last thought you have for your readers? Enjoy. Just enjoy. What could be a more perfect ending than that? Hey, thank you so much, Bella. I sure appreciate it. You're welcome. It. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Okay, nice job. Is there anything that we didn't cover that you would like to cover? Well, I did mention, um, when you, you mentioned actually Night Train to Chicago, and that is a very um, strong story, I think. Um, I sent Monique, my contact person, a copy of that story, and then she re she went when she told me her reaction to it. Especially, this is about a character um, who is going back to his native soil, as it were, or native mm -hmm. water mm -hmm. in this case, because he's going to commit suicide, hmm. and that's his plan. And he went from being he, he's a destroyed judge. A destroyed man, and he is going to commit suicide. Huh. And what happens on the train on the way to Chicago? Interesting. And I take it he makes a different decision. <laughs> the decision actually is made for him by circumstances. I love it. I love it. Anything else that you want to make sure that we cover? Can't think of it right now. You did a great job. This is going to be really lovely, and I think you'll be surprised at how, uh, how well you did. Did you feel good about it? Yeah. Good, good. Okay, we will get yes, this yes, off I to... Um, I, thank you very much. I'm very, very happy to have met you. I hope, uh, hopefully, if there's another podcast, I'm hoping that we can meet again and, would, and do the podcast. I would love to do that anytime. Hey, thank you so much, Bella. Have a great day. You're welcome, Chris, and thank you, and have a great day yourself. Thanks. Take care now. I will. You too. Bye. Bye. You've reached the end of another episode of the Global Summit House podcast. Subscribe to our podcast on Spotify, Podbean, iHeartRadio, iTunes, or Google Play. Connect with us at GlobalSummitHouse.com. See you on the next episode.